glad that you are here today, and uh, we're excited. We are, if you're joining us for the first time, we're starting a brand new series today and called, entitled The Blessed Life, and uh, so I'm ex- so excited about what God's going to do throughout this series, but I do want to take a moment just to reflect on all of God's blessings in our life and what God's been doing in our church over the last several weeks. Last Sunday in our service, our first service, we had an individual that came to the altar and said, I need Jesus and accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Can you give God praise for that? Can you give God praise for that? That never gets old because that is what we're here for as a church, okay? We're here to help people find and follow Jesus Christ and to connect with their Lord and Savior. And then throughout the uh, Get in the Game series, um, just uh, from a person after person talking about how they're trying to hear the voice of God more in their life and respond to what God's doing. The week we talked about spiritual discipline, so many of you guys emailed and said, hey, we engaged in that version app and we're trying to do some things and create some rhythms in our life that's gonna help us to continue to grow in our faith. And we're gonna be doing those version devotionals even throughout this series. Hopefully next Sunday, we'll have that uh, devotional up for you so that you can follow along. And then last week we talked about getting in the game and we had over 50 people say, hey, I wanna move into a place of servanthood. I want to honor God in that. I want to become more like Jesus. And over 50 people signed up to serve at our church so that the kingdom of God can be advanced. Can you give God praise for all of those incredible things that are happening in our church? And so this week, we're launching a brand new series throughout the month of November entitled The Blessed Life. And what we're going to do is over the next several weeks, we're going to look at a passage of scripture Um, a series of scriptures found in a um, section of the Bible that's known as the Sermon on the Mount. And the reason we've come to know this as the Sermon on the Mount is very simple. Jesus climbed a mountainside, and the Bible tells us that all kinds of people followed after him. They climbed the mountain, and all these people gathered around him, and Jesus sat down, and he began to teach principles about the kingdom of God. And it starts in the the Bible, in the book of Matthew, chapter 5. And one of these sections, one of these teachings of Jesus is what we've come to be, to be known as the Beatitudes. And what we're going to do over the next several weeks is we're going to look at some of these Beatitudes, and we are going to begin to see a picture of what it looks like to live the blessed life, what it looks like to live a life that is honoring God. Because here's the thing, like if I were to ask you this morning by a show of hands, how many of you want a blessed life? How many people want a blessed life? A blessed life, if you're not raising your hand, you are a liar. (laughs) Like, the reality is, if I walked up to anybody on the street, if I came up to any one of you inside of this church and I said, hey, would you like a blessed life? You'd be like, yes, I want my life to be blessed. I want my life to have good things going on in it. But the reality is, for so many people, blessed is not necessarily the word that we just instantly associate with our lives. To be honest with you, when I talk to people, I hear this word more often, struggling. Like when I talk to people, I hear about struggles inside their life. I hear about how their marriage maybe is struggling. I hear about how their family or their kids are struggling in life. I hear how maybe their career is struggling and maybe they're doing something to live paycheck by paycheck and and their finances are just struggling in life. I talk to people and I hear about how their spiritual life is just seems like it's struggling. That it seems like temptation after temptation is coming against them and they're just struggling to maintain this relationship with Jesus Christ that it seems like it's on the fringe. And when I talk to people, I don't necessarily always hear blessed. I hear struggling, and yet that was not the life that God intended any of us to live. And so on this Sermon on the Mount, in the Beatitudes that Jesus talks about, Jesus begins to paint a picture of what it looks like to live a blessed life. He paints a picture of what it looks like to live inside of the kingdom of God. Now, I've got a couple people that are going to come up here and help me illustrate something because we need to set a foundation. I think they're still over in the stairwell, and they're going to grab this rope, and one's going to go that way, and one's going to go the other way. Because here's the reality. If we are going to fully understand, go in front of me here, if we're fully going to understand the kingdom of God, and we're going to understand the blessed life, we have to have a proper view of what the kingdom of God looks like. Because here's the problem in so many of our lives. We have to get to a place where we learn to shift our perspective. When Jesus taught on the Sermon on the Mount, he was also talking about not just a temporary kingdom, he was talking about the kingdom of God. And so often in our lives, we focus on the temporary kingdom of this earth instead of the eternal kingdom of heaven. You see, Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11 tells this, it says this to us, it says, God has made everything beautiful for its own time. 
He's planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. That God has placed eternity in our heart, and so often we are living for temporary kingdoms instead of the eternal kingdom. If this rope represents eternity, down here on this end, this little section right here represents our life here and now. And so often we are living our lives for temporary blessings, for temporary moments in life. We're living our lives for this segment. God, can you bless me in this earthly moment? Can you bless me in this earthly kingdom? God, can you pour things into me? Can you bless me financially and bless my family and bless my health? And we're so focused on the earthly part of our lives that we forget that what God has placed in our life is eternity. And that down here represents the end of time. And if you look at the scope of this rope, your life is lived in such a small segment down there compared to the picture of eternity. And what the problem that so many of us have is we're only focused right here. Our perspective is what's going to happen right here, right now, and right in these moments, that we lose perspective of the eternal kingdom of God. When Jesus teaches in the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about the kingdom of God. He says there's an earthly kingdom that you are abiding in right now, but there is a heavenly kingdom, and there are principles to the kingdom of God that can bring blessings into your life. But to get those blessings, guess what? We have to shift our perspective. We can't just focus on this little segment of our life. We have to go, God, I'm living for the eternal kingdom. God, I'm living for the kingdom of God. And I understand that my life is more than just these earthly moments that are here right now. And as we go through this thing, if we talk about the kingdom of God, as we talk about the blessed life, we have to understand that the kingdom of God is more than just the temporary things that we so often focus on. Thank you guys for your help. You can just leave that rope right there, and I'm going to leave this up here. That's good. Can we give them a hand? They did such a good job holding that rope. So the Bible talks about the shift of perspective. Jesus talks about the shift of perspective that must take place. I love how C.S. Lewis put it. He says, if I find myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, The most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. That I was made for another world. That we are not made for this world. And the blessed life isn't necessarily God bless me here. It's about God, how do I live my life for the eternal things that you have prepared for me? There's an individual in the Bible by the name of Solomon. He actually wrote those words that we read in Ecclesiastes. Solomon was the son of David, the third king of Israel. And Solomon wrestled with this very fact of living for the earthly or living for the eternal. And if you've ever read through the book of Ecclesiastes, the whole book is really Solomon wrestling with how do I live my life? And here's what Solomon tells us. He says, I've got a lot of good things going on in my life. This is the summary of the book of Ecclesiastes. Read it on your own. I've got a lot of good things going on in my life. But at the end of the day, I'm starting to realize that everything that I have is meaningless if I don't have eternity set in my heart, if I don't have the picture of God set in my heart. And Solomon would say things like this, I've achieved all the education that I could achieve. The Bible tells us that Solomon was the wisest individual on the face of the earth. But what did Solomon come to realize? That education was meaningless if he did not have eternity set on his heart. He says, I have the greatest career. He was a king. He was an individual that had achieved great things in his life and for his career. And people would have looked at him and said he was successful. And Solomon says, but it is all meaningless meaningless if I do not have eternity set in my heart. The Bible says that Solomon looked around and he had the greatest amount of wealth. He was the wealthiest individual to walk the face of the earth. But you know what Solomon said about his wealth? He says, it's meaningless if I do not have eternity set in my heart. Solomon was the most popular individual in the world. Other kings, other nations came to sit at his feet to learn from him so that they could know how to be an incredible king. And Solomon would say, popularity is meaningless if I do not have eternity set in my heart. And then Solomon would even write, he says, you know what? I denied myself no pleasure. Anything that my eye saw, anything that my eye put its eye on that I wanted, I went after and I had, he denied himself no pleasures of the world. And yet he said at the end of the day, any pleasure that would come into his life was meaningless 
if he did not have eternity set in his heart. And we have to understand for the blessed life that God wants to have is that eternity has to be set in our heart, that the things that we so often chase after are meaningless if it's not in partnership with God. And so this is what Jesus says in the Beatitudes. Jesus would say this to you and I today. He would say, if you want to be blessed in your life, then you need to stay spiritually hungry. Here's how he says it in Matthew 5, verse 6. He said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed is the person's life who is hungry and thirsty for righteousness, for they will be filled. That word filled at the end can also be translated as fully satisfied. That those individuals who are hungry for God, those individuals who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be satisfied in life. And the reality is, is so many people in life, they're not satisfied. They're searching. They're looking for something. And the reality is, is that they are not blessed in their life. They are not satisfied in their life because they are not hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Now, the word righteousness is a biblical word that we see a lot of times throughout Scripture. If you were to do a study on it, you would see pages and pages and pages of information about what does righteousness mean. And I'm going to try to simplify it for you this morning real quickly. Righteousness is two things. Righteousness is a relationship And righteousness is a lifestyle. Righteousness is a relationship, and righteousness is a lifestyle. And it's important that we understand this because blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. So what are we hungering and thirsting for? It's a relationship and a a lifestyle. The relationship is simply this. It's about being right with God. That righteousness takes place when we get right with God. Romans 1 verse 17 says this. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. That the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, tells us how to achieve righteousness. How do we hunger and thirst for righteousness? It's about the good news taking place in our hearts, in our lives. And we're going to talk about that here in a second. But righteousness is also a lifestyle. Righteousness is a lifestyle, and it's about living right as God intended. Living right as God intended. 1 John 2 verse 29 says this, Since we know that Christ is righteous, we also know that all who do what is right are God's children. That because Christ lived a righteous life, if we live our lives as God intended, then we are right in God's sight and we become God's children, that we get righteous. And the Bible says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. See, we have to understand that we are made by God, for God. And until we understand this, this life that we live will not make sense. You are made by God, for God. And until we grasp that, this life will all be meaningless. So how do I get righteousness? How do we hunger and thirst for righteousness? See, righteousness is a relationship and righteousness is a lifestyle. So the first part about hungering and thirsting for righteousness is that we have to have that right relationship with God. We have to be in right standing. We have to accept God's love and mercy and grace in our life. And if you've walked in here today and you do not know Jesus Christ, I want to share with you what that looks like in your life just for a moment. For those of you who have already taken this step, be reminded of God's mercy and grace in your life. Because if we want to hunger and thirst, then we have to seek out a right relationship with God. If you want a right relationship with God, you need to know three things real simple this morning. Is The first is you can't make yourself righteous. You can't make yourself righteous. There's nothing you can do to make yourself in right standard with God. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Romans 3 verse 20 says this, For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. May we all be reminded that it's not about just keeping a bunch of laws. The laws are there to show us that we make mistakes. The laws are there to show us that we need grace and mercy. The laws are there to show us that we can't do it by ourselves, that you can't make yourself righteous, that there's nothing you can do to enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ. There's nothing that you can work for to get into a right relationship with Jesus Christ. 
The second thing we have to understand if we want a right relationship with God is that God sent Jesus to pay for my sins. There's nothing you can do. It's all about what's been done for you. It's about what Christ did on Calvary, giving up his son to die a painful death for the forgiveness of your sins and for the forgiveness of my sins. I couldn't do anything to earn God's love. It was all about what was done for me. In Romans 3, verse 23 through 25, he puts it this way. Yet God, with undeserved kindness, I love that. We have a God that gives us kindness that I don't deserve. And you have a God that gave you kindness that you did not deserve declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. For everyone has sinned, and may we all be reminded here, sometimes the longer we attend church, the more, and the more we forget that we are all sinners. We, the more we forget that we all have a past, the more that we forget that we all needed Christ's love, grace, and mercy. We become too religious sometimes, and we forget that it's all by the grace of God in our life, that there's nothing we can do. It's only what's been done for us. We've all fallen short of God's glorious grace. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. People are made right. How do we get righteous? People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back nothing. You see, we have to understand that Jesus paid that price and he does not punish those who sinned in times past. That there is nothing that you can do. It's only what's been done that gets you into a relationship with Jesus Christ. But the gospel doesn't end there. It's also about accepting by faith God's miraculous grace. You can't do anything. It's all about what's been done for you. And we just simply have to accept it. Romans 10 verse 9 through 10 says this. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by, it, for it's believing in your heart that you are made right with God and it's by openly declaring your faith that you are saved, that we are made right, we are righteous with God when we just simply confess and we believe in our heart what Christ has done for us. And if you've walked into this place today and you want a blessed life, it all starts with the foundation of Jesus Christ. And if you've walked in here today and you do not know Jesus, I pray today before this service is over that you would give your heart to Christ. If you are bordering, if you are wavering, if you're like, I don't even know if, if life was the end today, if I would spend eternity with God, you can secure a blessed life today by knowing Jesus Christ and having a right relationship with him. And I don't want you to leave this place without doing so today, to know the righteousness of God. But for some of you, you've been saved. You know God. You prayed those prayers. You, you understood that you couldn't do anything. It was what's done for you and accepted God's righteousness. But righteousness is not only a relationship, it's also a lifestyle. It's living life as God intended. So once we get right with God, how do we as individuals, followers of Jesus Christ, how do we keep a spiritual hunger? Because he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled, they will be satisfied. So let me share with you this morning five ways to keep a spiritual hunger for God. The first is this. If you want to keep your spiritual hunger for God, you need to remind yourself how much God loves you. You need to be at a perpetual place where you remind yourself of how much God loves you every single day of your life. That you do not forget the grace and the mercy of God that was poured into your life. That you do not forget what he did for you on Calvary. Because here's what I truly believe is that so many of us live with a distorted perspective of who God is in our life. And if we live with a distorted perspective of who God is, then we will not live our lives hungering and thirsting for righteousness. But if we believe that we serve a God who wants good things for his children, if we believe that we serve a God that has a destiny and future in store for us, if we believe that we serve a God that loves us unconditionally, and we have a proper view of who God is, then we will be hungry and thirsty for the things of God in our life. We'll, be, we'll go after him every single day. And so you need to be a type of person, if you want the blessed life, then you want to keep that spiritual hunger for God. You remind yourself every single day that you are a child of God and that you are loved by your heavenly father. It does not matter what the world says about you, but there is a God in heaven that loves you and wants a relationship with you. If you believe that, can you give Jesus Christ an ovation of praise? Amen and amen. 
Here's what the Bible says in Ephesians 3, verses 18 through 19. It says, and may you have the power to understand. I love how the the writer of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul, puts this. He says, may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should. He says, we should understand this, but we forget how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. You can't understand it fully. But may we try to every single day, and then you will be made complete. Another version says, then you will be filled with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. If you want to hunger and thirst for righteousness, if you want to have a spiritual hunger for God, you need to remind yourself how much God loves you. The second thing you need to do is you need to make knowing God a daily pursuit. It needs to be your number one priority. It needs to be the thing that you chase after every single day of your life, that I want to know God. I want to know him more personally. When you met your spouse, you wanted to know everything about them, didn't you? I mean, I remember staying up at like ridiculous times at night talking on the phone. I don't do it anymore. Maybe that's wrong on me. I give my wife a hard time. Like she used to drive to come see me and now it's like nine o'clock and she's ready to go to bed, right? But like when you're in that place and you know that you have a God that loves you, you have somebody that loves you, you do everything to pursue them and to know them. If we want to hunger and thirst for righteousness, if we want to hunger and have a spiritual hunger for God, we need to make knowing God our number one priority. Psalm 63, one says it this way. This is the psalmist David, and he writes this, and he says, God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul, what it thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. And David talks about this hunger, this pursuit of God every single day of his life. And David writes this in the desert of Judah. And he writes out and he says, God, you are my God. I'm pursuing you every single day of my life. Even in the desert place, David says, I am pursuing you. God. Can I tell you, some of you guys are like David today. You're in that desert place though. You're in that desert of Judah. And for some of you, you might would say to me, Aaron, my my marriage is in a desert place and it just feels like it's dried up. For some of you, you would say my my career feels like it's in a desert place and it just feels like it's dried up. My relationships with people seems like it's in a desert place and it's just like it's dried up. Financially, I'm in a desert place and it just feels like it's all dried up. And if we take off to the words of David, what do you do when you are in the desert? What do you do when you feel like some things have dried up in your life? When in the earthly sense, you don't feel like the blessings of God are being poured out in your life, you do exactly what David did. You cry out for God. You hunger and thirst for God because even in the desert place, when you get hungry for God and you make knowing God a daily pursuit in your life, here's what scripture says, he will fill you up. That even when it seems like everything else is dried up, that there is a a, a spiritual water that can be poured into your life. And if you find yourself in that place today, I want to encourage you, seek after God, yearn for God, go after God because he will fill you. If you want to keep your spiritual hunger, the third thing you have to do is you have to engage in God's word every day. You have to engage in God's word. You have to allow it to saturate your heart and your spirit. You need to know the promises of God for your life. You need to know the view of God for your life. In 1 Peter 2, verse 2, the apostle Peter writes it this way, like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment. This is talking about the word of God in your life. My, my son Landon, he turns five today, and my, my, my boy Jackson will be uh, three in December. And so I'm not that far away from having really young kids. And here's what I remember when they were young. I love this imagery. When they were newborn babies, they could not talk. But I can tell you something. If we went past the time to feed them, it's like craziness broke out in the house. They start yelling and screaming. And I couldn't make a bottle quick enough. 
I couldn't warm it up fast enough to get that nourishment into them because they knew that they were lacking something. And this is the picture that the Apostle Peter says should be a part of our lives, that we should engage God's word like newborn babies. It should be when we don't go without it, if we don't have it for a while, that there's something missing in our life and we start crying out for this nourishment. God, I need this. God, I need this hunger. I need this thirst because I'm missing something in my life. When my boys didn't get their bottle, they were upset and they were angry. But when they got the bottle into them, all of a sudden they started calming down because they had, they had the nourishment that they needed for the soul. If you do not have the word of God planted deep in your heart, if you are not engaging it in a daily basis, you will not have the hunger and thirst for God that you need in your life. Make it a priority. Make it your number one priority. The fourth thing is this, is we need to learn to seek out community. Proverbs 2 verse 20 says this, follow the steps of good men instead and stay on the paths of righteousness. Stay, follow the steps of good men instead and stay on the paths of righteousness. Who you associate with will influence what you are hungry for. Who you associate with will influence what you are hungry for. Like when I think back to when I was in high school, here's what I realize. And I'll talk to our students for a second. Most of the stupid things you'll do in high school is when you're around a certain crowd. That was the story of my life. Like I didn't do stupid things when I was by myself. I did it when I was with people, all right? Get around a certain group and all of a sudden that changes. And the same is true about our relationship with Jesus Christ. Who you associate will influence what you're hungry for. You get around somebody that all they're ever hungry for is what's happening in the stock market and finances, and that's what you surround yourself with, then you'll become hungry for those things. You get around somebody that's only hungry for certain things in life. You get around somebody who's hungry about sports, and that's all they ever talk about, then that's going to become what's a part of your life. You get around somebody that all they ever influence with and associate with is politics, then that's what you're going to be hungry for. That's what you're going to be consumed by. But you get around some people who are hungry for God in their life, and they were going to be begin to rub off on you, and that will become what you become associated with, and your relationship and your hunger for God will increase in your life. It's why we as a church, we're going to get more intentional about this. I want to see people in groups. I want to see us in community where we're getting around people who have the same like-mindedness as we do and we're pursuing the same things. And all of a sudden, as we get around people and we rub shoulders with people, the scripture says iron sharpens iron, that all of a sudden our hunger for God increases because we're around other people that want the same things as we do. Don't misinterpret this. I'm not telling you not to be around people who are far from God because they need your influence. But what I'm telling you is don't allow them to influence you. Make sure that there is a balance in it where you are around people that are hungry for the things of God in their lives. The final thing, and the band can get ready to come, is you want a spiritual hunger in your life, you need to stop filling up on junk food. You need to stop filling up on junk food. Proverbs 15, 14 says this, a wise person is hungry for knowledge. A wise person is hungry for knowledge while a fool feeds on trash. Proverbs 15, 14. Are you hungry for knowledge? Because the fools feed on trash. See, we know this to be true, don't we? We need to stop filling up on junk food. How many of you have ever gone to a restaurant? Let's take a Mexican restaurant, for example. And what do they do? They bring out that basket of chips, don't they? And you don't just eat one basket, do you? You eat two and three and four. And for those of you that are like cheap like me, like we love that. I try to ask them if I can just purchase water because that's free. <laughs> just get chips and water. But what happens? We fill up on those chips. And then the, when we get the meal that we ordered, when we get the meat, we're like, I'm, I'm full, I'm full. Or we go to the steakhouse, Texas Roadhouse, and they bring those rolls out with that butter on it. Mmm. You guys are getting hungry now, aren't you? And we eat biscuit after biscuit. And then they bring the steak out, like the, the, the main event, and you can't even eat it all. 
because you filled up on the junk food beforehand. And the reality is, is so often in our spiritual lives, we're feeding up on things that don't really matter. Let me ask you this question. In your life, what do you hunger for? What are you hungry for in your life? What are you pursuing? What matters most to you? And because we're in church, I know what you would all say. What matters most is pleasing God. What matters most is a relationship with God. That's the church answer, right? Let me ask you this. If I ask those that are closest to you, if I ask those that know you, what would they say? Better yet, just take a snapshot of your life for the last week. If you reviewed your life life for the last seven days, what were you characterized with pursuing? What really mattered in your life? Because the honest truth is so many people's lives are filled with things that don't really matter. And we're searching for anything that will bring meaning. We're like Solomon. We're trying things to bring meaning in our life. Let me paint another picture with this. If this vase represented your life, if this represented who you were, So often we're filling our lives with things that don't really matter. Like we're pursuing the comforts of the world. Like we, maybe you say, man, I work all week so that I can just have some comforts in my life and and we're filling our life up with those things. For some of us, we're pursuing our careers and there's nothing wrong with your career. But the reality is, is you're more hungry to climb the ladder at work than you are for the things of God. For some of you, it's this education, it's, it's wisdom and and education's a good thing. I tell people, get as much education as you can. But the reality is, is you're more hungry for just knowledge than you are for the things of God. For some of you, it's pleasure. What's going to bring pleasure to your life? And that's what you seek out. You are hungry and thirsty for pleasure. For some of you, it's that wealth. Like you're consumed with how much money do you have in your bank account? How, much, how big can you make that account? How much can you get in life? For some of you, it's just fun. Like, I, I'm living my life just to have fun, to do anything that's going to feel like it's enjoyment in my life, and we're filling our lives up. For some of you, it's that popularity. It's that image. And you are hungry for a certain image, and you will do whatever is necessary to, to make people think that you are popular, that you have an image. It's why you spend so much time on Facebook and social media posting pictures and making your world seem so great, because you're hungry for popularity, for an image. For some of you, it's just the win. What is the win? For some of you, it's, man, I'm, I'm hungry for my kids to achieve something sp- specific. And there's nothing wrong with that. For some of you, it's the bigger house, the newest cars, the newest gadgets, and, and you're pursuing that win. And the reality is this is, becomes our life. We're hungry and thirsty for these things. And at the end of the day, we wonder why, when we lay our head down at night, why we're so empty. We wonder why we're not full. We wonder why that our life is so consumed with this because in and of himself, there's nothing wrong with these things. But it's not the things that God has for you. I mean, there's nothing wrong with the biscuits at the steakhouse. But man, there's so much better that God has for you. And so we wonder why we're not as blessed. And the reason is because we're not hungering and thirsting for righteousness. So what do we do when we realize that we're not hungering for the things of God? What do we do when we realize that we're not pursuing the things of God as he intended us to pursue? We have to do this. We change our appetites. We change our appetites. Anybody ever gone on a diet and you gave up something that you loved beforehand? And after a period of being on that diet, maybe it was pizza, maybe it was pop, maybe it was something like that, and you dieted and you remove that from your life for a period of time, 30, 60, 90 days. And then all of a sudden you come back and you're like, man, I love pizza. And you get a pizza in front of you and take a bite of that pizza. And then you're like, man, this doesn't taste as good as it used to. 
Wow, that, that pop tastes different. Why does it taste different? It's because you did something inside of your life to change the appetite that you were going after. You did something. You shifted something in your life so that you were pursuing something that was better for you. And the same thing has to happen in our lives. And this is how we change our appetites. We do those very things that we just talked about to create a spiritual hunger in our lives. We allow God's love to be poured into our lives. We remind ourselves who God is and what it is that he's done for us. We remind ourselves that God paid an ultimate price in our life. And the more that we get filled up with God, the more these things start popping out in our life. We pursue God daily. We go after God. We chase after God. And we say, God, I want more of you. And all of a sudden, those things that have been consuming our lives aren't the same anymore. We get into the word of God. We engage scripture like we've never engaged scripture before. And all of a sudden, we begin to allow these things to get pushed out. Because what are we doing? We're changing our appetite. And then we get around people who are going to strengthen us, who are going to make us better. And before we know it, our lives are getting filled up with the things of God more than the things of this world. You see, we begin to change our appetite. If our view is just right here, then our appetite is just going to be for the things of this world. But the blessed life isn't just looking at the here and now. The blessed life is looking at eternity and saying, if I have a right relationship with God, that's what matters. And when I change and I hunger and thirst for God, God brings blessings into my life. But we can't keep focusing right here. But here is the incredible thing about God. This is what I love about Jesus. When we do this, when we change our appetites, and we're no longer consumed with this stuff, here's what Scripture tells us. It's in this same passage of Scripture on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6. He says this. He says, seek the kingdom of God. No, no, no. We're not for the temporary. Seek God's kingdom. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Live what? Righteously. Hunger and thirst for righteousness and you will be filled. And here's his promise back to us. And he will give you everything you need. When you pursue God, when you hunger and thirst for God, then those things that you've been trying to focus after, some of those comforts and and maybe some benefits and some of the wins in your life and and these other things that you're looking for, for your education, and and maybe these things that you start wanting in your life, the win and, and some wealth and some prosperity, what God does is he still pours those into your life. But what what happens? They're not consuming your life. He says, I add them on top of your life because you're no longer looking for the temporary pleasures. You are looking for the eternal things and God blesses your life. And God says, I'll still give you some of these things because I love you and because I'm a good God that wants great things for his kids. But the reality is, is we can't fill our lives with these things. If that's the pursuit of your life, you will not be blessed. It's only when you shift your perspective and say, God, I'm moving from temporary to the eternal. And when we accept Jesus Christ, we should understand that we have a blessed life because no matter what happens in this world, we are secured for eternity. Would you stand to your feet with me this morning? Are you hungering and thirsting for righteousness? Do you want the blessed life? So let me ask you this with every head bowed and every eye closed. See, the blessed life is a relationship and it's a lifestyle. And for some of you, maybe you've walked into this place today and you would say to me, Aaron, I don't know if I have that relationship. You can't have the blessed life unless you start with the foundation, with the relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you were to say to me, Aaron, I don't know if I'm right with God that I, I don't know if I've ever came to the place where I realize there's nothing that I can do, but it's all about what Christ did on Calvary for me. And today, I want to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I want to confess that I believe in him, that he was resurrected from the grave, and he sits at the right hand of the Father. And if you're here today and you don't have a right relationship with Jesus Christ, would you just acknowledge that today? Would you just lift your hand and say, Aaron, I need to do that. I need to get right with God today. I, I want the blessed life, but I can't do it unless I'm right with God See that hand back there? The other hands? Anybody else today? Anybody else? Don't leave this place not knowing if your relationship with God is right. Amen. Amen. Second thing, if you're here today and you would say to me, Aaron, I love God, but the reality is, is I'm not hungering and thirsting for righteousness. 
The reality is, is I filled my life up with some things that don't really matter. But I don't want that to be anymore. I want to change my appetite. I want to rearrange some things in my life so that my life can be blessed. Not just for these earthly moments, but for all of eternity. If you're here today and you can acknowledge, Aaron, there's some things that are out of place. Would you just raise your hand? Would you just raise your hand in this place? See those hands. See those hands. See those hands. Amen. Here's what we're going to do. Is our band's going to come out and they're going to lead us in a song. I'm going to pray over us. But if you're here today, as we sing this song, whether you raise your hand or didn't, if you need a relationship with Jesus Christ, we're going to open up these altars. For some of you, maybe you just need to pray where you're at and you just need in this song to cry out to God and your prayer needs to be this, God, fill me. Help me hunger after you. But if that's you today, if you need to find a place in this altar to accept Jesus or to have prayer about some things that are distracting you, you're out in this audience today, would you once again today just simply cry out, God, God, I need you, God. I'm hungry for you. I'm hungry for the things of God in my life above everything else. I'm going to seek after you, God. I'm going to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Dear Heavenly Father, today, God, in these moments that we have available today, God, with these moments that we have left today, God, I pray that you stir our hearts. God, I want us to be a people that are blessed, but God, we can't be blessed unless we're hungering and thirsting for you. So God, help us to rearrange things in our life that need to be rearranged. God, for some of us that have walked in here today, God, God, we're unsure about our relationship with Jesus Christ, Lord. And God, I don't want us to leave this place, Lord, doubting for one moment, God, that you love us and that you are concerned about us, Lord. So God, if there's somebody here today that needs you, God, I pray that they would walk down to this altar today and declare that you are Lord over all. And God, that they begin the, the journey of a blessed life. So God, move in our hearts right now. Speak to us and challenge us in a powerful way. In your name we pray, amen. And amen. If that's you today, would you respond? And if you would, in your seats, would you just worship God and thank him for what he's already done in our hearts and in our lives? Come on, church.